Thank you, Emily. And it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, give one of my favorite lectures of the year. So I hope you like it. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, vaccine technologies and uh, immunization. And after the pandemic, it became so easy to update this lecture because so much has happened in the last three years. So really, the, the field has been revolutionized uh, uh, by necessity <laughs> to respond to a pandemic. So I'm going to tell you a little bit how the pandemic has pushed the vaccine technologies forward uh, because we basically leverage, uh, um, we developed and approved vaccines at record speed. We, we basically developed a new technology that was uh, proven safe and effective, which is the RNA vaccines. Uh, we were able to manufacture vaccines at mass scale, uh, also at, at unprecedented speed. And also we realized during the pandemic how important it was to develop vaccines that were inexpensive and thermostable, so they could be deployed uh, worldwide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how technologies helped us to accomplish all of this, and I'm going to tell you how we're going to uh, forward, what, are, what is the future. Okay, so just to give you a sense of how quickly we're able to respond, this is, uh, so my institute, um, we have been responding to outbreaks and pandemics for a long time. So this is a, a timeline of how quickly it took us from the beginning of an outbreak to go into phase one trials once a new disease was identified. So during the first SARS outbreak in 2003, it took 20 months to develop vaccine from the identification of the, the, the new infection to phase one. And then we responded to the H5N1 influenza outbreak. It was 11 months. We went down to four months for H1N1. In doing Zika, it took about three months, a little over three months to go into phase one trial with a recombinant, with a DNA uh, vaccine. And for, for the latest outbreak, it took us 65 days. So the, we're getting better and better responding quickly. And this is enabled by new technologies and new ways to, to do business. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So traditionally, vaccines uh, have been developed using empirical methods. So in tra the traditional vaccines that we've been using for years usually are either whole inactivated viruses for viral vaccines or viruses have been attenuated through passaging in cell culture or animal and so that they adapt and then they, they lose some of their functions and they um, attenuate. In, in, in recently, we have been using more of a rational approach to vaccine development where you basically try to understand first what is the desirable immune response that you want to obtain with a vaccine during some immunological studies and then you design a vaccine that tries to achieve exactly that immune response. So it's more of a rational. You don't just try and see what happens. And uh, and, and the, the shift toward this rational vaccine design, again, has been enabled by the development of new technologies that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. And so this is more or less how the rational vaccine design process works. So you start from, uh, uh, you take some serum or immune cells from people that maybe recover from an infection. You um, you test these uh, immune cells, usually antibodies, um, and you bind them on an epitope that you know that this is the, the main viral epitope on the surface of the virus. You identify what are the most strongly neutralizing antibodies, for example. So this is probably the antibodies that you want to induce with the vaccine. And then you design an, a, an antigen that expresses those exact epitopes on the surface of the antigen. You develop a, a test vaccine you test it in animals, and you see if, in fact, you're getting the same immune responses that you wanted to achieve. And then you, you do this again over and over again, and, and you tweak the vaccine until you get the optimal immune responses, and then you go into a clinical trial. And I think one of the best examples of this was what was done um, before COVID for RSV. So we have, the scientists have been wanting to develop an RSV vaccine for many, many years. Um, but unsuccessfully. So uh, this is a paper is from 2017, a group from um, uh, my institute, uh, Barney Graham and uh, Jason McKellen. Basically, um, they they looked at the, the structure of the uh, prefusion F protein, and that protein can uh, present itself in two different shapes. <laughs> it can be the prefusion uh, protein looks like a ball, and the postfusion looks like a, like a rod. So what they did is they took 
uh, a, 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 a library of antibodies that have different levels of neutralization and they map these antibodies on two different, these two different proteins. So the most strongly neutralizing antibodies are the one in red. So when they start mapping these antibodies, they immediately realize that the most strongly neutralizing antibodies in red and orange, they were only binding to the pre-fusion uh, protein. They were not binding to the post-fusion protein. So it became natural to think, okay, maybe we should um, lock the protein in the pre-fusion conformation so that we are going to induce the strongly neutralizing antibodies. And, and if you fast forward many, uh, like several years, this is exactly the basis for the new RSV vaccines that have just been licensed in US for the elderly. So this was from May 3rd, the uh, announcement on, on the right. So this opened a whole new field because many other viruses use the same mechanism of entry as RSV. So what uh, Barney Graham and his colleagues did uh, is that they tried to see if the same thing is true for other viruses that use class one fusion. It's the same mechanism of entry that RSV uses. And so they did. So before the pandemic, they tried to do the same thing with the uh, SARS-1 and MERS, which are related to SARS-CoV-2. And they realized that also for this viral family, the same thing is true, that the pre-fusion protein is, uh, has the most, induces the most strongly neutralizing antibodies. So this was really important information to have if you fast forward to the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, when we had to develop a vaccine very quickly, we already knew how to stop to present the antigen to to induce good antibodies. And in addition, oops, in addition, we also had uh, we knew the mRNA vaccines back then in 2020. They were not licensed, but people have worked on them for many years, and we knew that they were very very rapid to produce. They were safe and non-toxic. The, the vaccine degrades in two to three days in the body, just enough time to produce the antigen and to induce a good immune response because the antigen is expressed intracellularly, induces uh, a more complete set of immune responses, and you don't induce a vector-specific immunity. So in the very beginning of the pandemic in 2020, with our institute has to decide what technologies to use to make a COVID vaccine quickly. So we knew how to make the protein, and uh, very soon was realized, let's try, let's try mRNA vaccine because it's going to be the fastest way to get a product. Nobody knew if it was going to work. <laughs> and in fact, they tried different technologies as well in parallel, just to hope, hope, hoping that something would work. The disadvantage of mRNA vaccines, of course, is that we, in 2020, we didn't know if it was going to work. We never had a vaccine that was licensed based on mRNA. So it was a bit of, you know, some guessing game. Uh, we probably, booster shots are required, unlike some other technologies do not, like live alternative vaccines, sometimes you, you're lucky with one in, injection. They're quite expensive to produce, and the stability is an issue. So we had to, very early on, we knew there were a lot of work had to be done to make the vaccine more turbo stable, so it would be more accessible to the broader world. Okay, so this is how you make an mRNA vaccine. This is why it's so fast. <laughs> you basically need a sequence, the sequence of the antigen that you want to express. Uh, you clone that sequence into a plasmid DNA. You linearize the DNA plasmid, and that's the, the template to start producing in vitro copies of mRNA, which is your vaccine. And then you formulate that with an LMP. So it's like a delivery method. And that's your vaccine that you inject uh, intramuscularly. And, and and so this is the first vaccine license, by the way, that it's um, produced in vitro. All the other vaccines that are licensed are produced in bioreactors. This is only the first vaccine that you can make just without any cellular components. You just use proteins and, uh, and uh, replicates uh, uh, and components and nucleotides. Okay, so... But, so just to give this your sense how quickly things moved in the, in the very early days of the pandemic. So the sequence of the new virus was uh, published in January of uh, 10. Within five days, we have a vaccine that was ready for GMP production. So, and in fact, they started GMP production. Our division uh, completed the phase one trial. So they start getting everything ready. So it took about two months from the sequence to be published to starting a phase one trial. It took about four months to initiate the phase two trial. It took a little over six months to initiate a phase three trial. So this was really unprecedented 
speed by which things were moving. Everything was being done in parallel to just to make sure that, you know, that we actually had a product that could be used for the, to control the pandemic. So, but as I said, we, nobody knew what was going to work. Um, so there were several efforts that were started in parallel. In addition to mRNA, we use adenovirus vector vaccines. And so there are two companies, uh, there are ma many companies that use this technology, but the companies that we work most closely with was Janssen and uh, Oxford, uh, AstraZeneca. So basically in this case, you use a innocuous virus, which is adenovirus, they cause the common cold, and you basically is enact is modified in order that not to cause any disease. You clone the the protein of a different virus into it, and now you have an adenovirus, a recombinant adenovirus, that express the spike protein of the virus. So the the advantage of this uh, platform is this is a very well established technology. We we actually had licensed vaccines based based on this technology before the pandemic. Uh, it's plug and play. You just basically insert a new protein, but the system is always the same. You have a strong B and T cell immune response. It's thermostable, which is really helpful when you're trying to immunize billions of people worldwide. You can scale up production and it's low cost. So this is all good. The disadvantages are that sometimes previous exposure to the vector can reduce effectiveness and also is relatively complex to manufacture. It's not as fast as mRNA to because this is a living organism. So you have to tweak a little bit when you insert a new protein, you have to make sure that it's uh, modified to, so to enable good, you know, uh, level of production. Okay, and then the other technology that was in parallel also initiated for vaccines was just the classic subunit protein with adjuvant. Um, and this is the, the, the companies that we, the companies we worked with was Novavax, and Sanofi GSK, where you basically express a protein in vitro, you you add an adjuvant, and that's your vaccine. And an advantage is this is a well-established technology. Many vaccines use this technology. It's suitable for people with the compromised immune systems. You have no live components. It's relatively stable. The disadvantages are is relatively complex to manufacture. You have to do a lot of purification of the product. You probably need adjuvants and booster shots. And to determine the best antigen um, adjuvant combination takes a little time. Okay, and then moving forward, as um, we now have additional technology, I'm not going to tell you all of them, but there is a new spin on the mRNA technology that is just started to take hold, which is the self-replicating mRNA platform. So if you look to the right, the irregular mRNA vaccine gets into the cell, it gets translated by the cellular ribosomes, and you get your protein, your antigen. This new self-replicating mRNA on the left get into the cell, they translate the antigen on the left, but they also express a replicase machinery from, an, from some viral system. So this replicase machinery start replicating the input mRNA so that you end up with a lot more mRNA and a lot more antigen. So the idea of this system is that you can probably can lower the dose, which lower the cost of an mRNA vaccine. Instead of giving, say, 100 microgram or 30 microgram, you might be able to give one-tenth of that because the cell is doing all the work of producing more. And, and then there are some uh, vaccines. So there's one in India has been approved by this company, Genova. And there is a company, uh, Arcturus, that is in phase three trials in Vietnam. And there's many other vaccines of this type in clinical development. Okay, so so basically, we I think um, the the current COVID vaccines have been really good at reducing deaths, as we heard a lot yesterday, and and reducing severe disease. But as with emergence of new um, of new variants, uh, basically the vac they have not been very good at protecting against infection and transmission. So the the, the infection keeps circulating, and new variants are going to come. So because of this. Um, in U.S., the White House uh, announced, uh, like last month, they're launching a big program to develop next-generation COVID vaccines. These would be vaccines that are uh, mucosal vaccines, broadly protective vaccines, and also new monoclonals. And that, with the idea that we're trying to fight the emergence of new variants, and hopefully we're going to try to figure out a way to stop, to reduce the circulation of, of, uh, of these virus. 
So the idea of mucosal vaccines, I think you heard a little bit about it yesterday, there was Adam gave a whole presentation, is if you induce a strong uh, immune responses locally at the side of the entry where the virus infects, which is in the, uh, in, in the nasal cavities, in the oral cavity, or in the lung, you might be able to have a faster immune recall after viral exposure, your cells like immunity right locally to block the infection. You might be able to uh, uh, block potentially infection or at least reduce infection, but the most important thing you want to block transmission. So it's not just protecting yourself, you're not allowing the virus to spread further. And also it's good because you don't need a needle to deliver these vaccines. So we, uh, our institute in collaboration with CEPI, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bard and Wellcome Trust. So these are the major funders worldwide of vaccine development, held a workshop in November to discuss exactly that. How do we develop uh, mucosal vaccines? The report of this workshop has been published. You have the link there. But basically, um, there are several gaps in research. You heard some of them yesterday. Uh, most imp that include the, what are the mucosal correlates of protection or the vaccines are licensed based on uh, uh, serum levels of antibodies. So we don't really understand how mucosal co correlate to protection, mucosal um, immunity. We don't have standardized assays and sampling protocols to collect uh, mucosal um, uh, fluids from the mucosa to measure the, the response to the vaccine. And we need to figure out new regulatory pathways to allow for licensure of this vaccine. But this is exciting. I think with these investments, hopefully we'll see a lot of progress in the next few months. Okay, quickly switching to vaccine manufacturing. Uh, vaccine manufacturing has to be reliable, efficient, low cost, and flexible to really allow us to meet the demand. There are four different ways to manufacture vaccines. We have in vitro for mRNA vaccines, no cellular components. We have cell cultures, and this is to, to this is to most of the vaccines are use uh, are produced using cell culture systems like uh, recombinant viral vectors, lab attenuated the recombinant proteins. We have some vaccines that use egg based uh, vaccines, uh, egg based production like influenza vaccines, and I think even the yellow fever vaccine. And there is a plant based production, and I'll mention something about that. And so there. Are Three, the, you're going to hear a whole lecture of manufacturing. So this is super high level, but there are three steps to biomanufacturing. There is the cell culture piece where you produce your antigen. Then you have purification where you have to purify your antigen for all the other components. And then you do quality control. For, so you, you, the product that you have, you make sure is exactly what you want to, to use as, as a vaccine. And as the, as you move from left to right, uh, the, the cost, decreases, but the quality of the product increases. Uh, again, very high level. These are the biggest um, innovations in biomanufacturing in the next, in the last few years. Is one that we use now, you can use single use bioreactors. It used to be that you have these big like metal tanks that you had to clean and requalify for every time you produce a new vaccine. Now you have these tanks that hold a plastic bag that is disposable. So it's much easier at the cleanup and the requalification uh, and gives you greater flexibility. You have less risk of contamination between batch to batch. Uh, you have automated uh, analytic, analy processes for analytical technologies. So everything is computerized. So you have a, a computer that follows all the steps of manufacturing to make sure if there is a problem, you catch it right away. And another exciting thing, and I hope the next lecture will talk about it, is continuous manufacturing. So it used to be that after you uh, produce the antigen, you had to harvest, and then you bring it to another room to do the purification, and then you bring it to another room. Now they can they figure out a way to do everything in continuous manufacturing. So as the vaccine is being produced, it goes straight into purification, then goes straight to QA, and then you have a product. So uh, this reduces small footprint and also reduce costs because you can actually reuse some of the components for manufacturing, for example. Okay, one example of a vaccine technology that is novel and was actually enabled by the pandemic was the plant-based expression. So um, there was a vaccine, the first vaccine that was a licensed use plants was by Medicago. It made a VLP vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. It was approved in Canada last year. Everybody was excited because it was the first time. Exactly a year later, the vaccine company was shut down. <laughs> Not because the vaccine didn't work, the vaccine works fine. 
is that there was too much competition. It was like a market decision. There was there were too many vaccines in the market already, and they couldn't actually scale up the production to meet demand. So it, the main company decided to shut down production, which is unfortunate. But there was a proof of concept that this theoretically can work. Okay. Vaccine delivery. So uh, there are different ways to deliver vaccines. The classical one is needle and syringe. But of course, now we are developing more and more ways to do the mucosal delivery using microneedles and nanoparticles. Uh, so as I said, there is a big push to develop uh, mucosal vaccines for COVID-19. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a slide from a Chinese company, uh, CanSino Biologics that is trying to adapt their adenovirus recombinant vaccine, which is uh, normally injected by needle and syringe IM, using these uh, nebulizers to, so the, to deliver it mucosally. So they've done some preliminary studies showing that, in fact, the vaccine can retain the same morphology. And the, depending on how fine you nebulize your vaccine, you can decide where the vaccine is going to be delivered. So for larger particles, there are about 10 micrometers, those stop in the nasal cavity. The smaller you make the particle, the, the lower down in the respiratory tract you can de de uh, uh, deposit your vaccine. So there is, um, uh, and, and so studies are ongoing to figure out how different immune responses are going to be once you do, you decide uh, the exact site you want the vaccine to go to. So you'll see much more of this data as uh, the, the, in the next few months and years. Okay. Micro patch, there's been a lot to talk about using rather than needle and syringe, these micro patches. Uh, the new technologies are allowing uh, a 3D printing of this tiny, tiny micro patch that have vaccine in it. Uh, the good the advantage of these micro patches, of course, is you can self-deliver theoretically, but you also they're they're solid, so you can uh, they're more stable to 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 temperature, they're more thermostable. There are these new micro patches on the on the top. Uh, right, they actually are micro needles. That as soon as they touch your skin, they hydrate and the, the needles detach and they stay in your skin. And then the antigen slowly leaks into your skin and it gets picked up by the Langerhans cells uh, in the, the sites where there's the most, the highest number of, of immune cells. So this is all happening uh, currently. And then just one slide on thermostability. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done and. It will take a whole lecture to talk about this, but just um, I want to say that the vaccines currently that are easiest to deliver, which are the one on the top left, which is single bile liquid vaccines, also happen to be the least thermostable. The vaccines that are most complicated to deliver on the top, on the right, which are two separate vials of uh, lyophilized vaccine and uh, uh, you know the 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 liquid to to uh, to to make the vaccine, to, to dilute the vaccine, they're the most uh, thermostable, but they're also complicated. And more complications you introduce, the more uh, it's more likely that you, you're going to introduce a problem with the vaccine because maybe you use the wrong diluent, maybe you don't dilute it correctly and so forth. So there is a lot of work that is happening right now to use both uh, physical ways like uh, uh, spray drying and leophilization on the right, as well as excipients, which are antioxidants and these matrices that don't allow the proteins to, to clump together to make the vaccines easy to deliver, but also thermostable, just to push all, all the, to, to change this, this, uh, this, this, the situation, the current situation. Okay. So, and there is, that's, this is uh, happening for mRNA vaccines are particularly the thermostability has been a particular problem. So there is some work going on right now to make them more thermostable, which is going to make it easier to deliver to worldwide. And there is a new uh, nano uh, uh, NLC, it's called nanostructural lipid carrier, that has been shown that you can store that bulk liquid for a, a, in the refrigerator for up to a year. And if you if you resuspend your mRNA in this carrier, you can extend dramatically the lifespan of your uh, mRNA vaccine. Okay, so what is next? So this is going super fast, but there are some exciting things at the horizon. Uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, nanopart vaccines made based on nanoparticles are going to become more and more uh, common. Now there are ways, we're using computer programs to actually design 
uh, a vaccine with as many proteins on the outside of these particles as you desire. So you, if you look at this IM, you can make them, you can make a nanoparticle look in any ways you want. And, and then maybe for some vaccines, you want a very packed particle with lots of antigens. And for some other vaccines, you want a, a less densely decorated particle. You can all do this, all of these with these programs. And so, and there is a vac the first vaccine that was licensed also during COVID-19 based on a nanoparticle was licensed by a Korean company. And uh, this was a, a, um, a, 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 the clinical data looked great, but again, because there wasn't so much demand and the, 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 the market was flooded with other vaccines, they stopped production. Again, not because it doesn't work, but because there was too much competition. Okay. And then um, we're going to use more and more these omic systems to understand more globally, the immune response of a vaccine beyond just uh, antibodies and T cells and try to understand where are the serological signatures, the microlay in a patient, the microlay with the good outcome versus the bad outcome. So they've done a lot of studies in hospitalized patients with SARS-CoV-2. They've taken their plasma, they use this humoral profiling where they look at like lots and lots of different immune responses and then they, they see what happens to the patient. So some patients are going to die and some patients are going to recover. And they're going, they're starting to see patterns where you might be able to predict which patient is going to go down the bad path just by the profiling in the early days of the disease. So this would be very powerful because that means you can identify patients at risk much earlier and you can really focus on them. And the same thing, you can do similar studies are happening with the metabolomic studies. So changes in the metabolism correlate with outcomes in some of these patients. Okay. And the other last, I think the last thing I'm talking about is artificial intelligence and how it's being employed right now to design vaccines and test vaccines. And, um, and this can be used for, to match the right antigen with the right adjuvant, or can be uh, used to identify the right uh, structure of a protein to, to, to make a good vaccine and so forth. And I'm going to give you some examples. So this is a paper actually from last week, uh, was published in, yeah, exactly last week. <laughs> How you can use AI to design mRNA vaccines that are more potent and stable. So if you, if you look on the left, this is a normal mRNA molecule. And what happens is it, it automatically folds on itself to make these loops, these double strand loops. And, and using AI, it takes 11 minutes to take the same uh, sequence, uh, optimize the codons in a way that you don't allow all these faults to happen and you make the codons a little more efficient. And so when you do this process, so the, the protein that is produced is exactly the same, it's just the codons are going to change. This study shows that you can, compared to conventional vaccines, these optimized vaccines induce almost 130 times more antibodies in mice and extended the shelf life by six folds. So this is a very first paper, but this is exciting as you might be able to use this for, you know, licensed vaccines. You can use AI to predict what is exactly the structure of a protein that will induce immune, immune response. Um, this is uh, the structure of um, the receptor binding protein in the spike. Using computer AI, they figure out where peptides will fit exactly in the fold of the receptor binding domain. And if you use those in animals, you actually block the infection. So now they're in clinical trials to see if you can use these uh, uh, mini binder inhibitors as uh, therapies. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this one because, um, yeah. <laughs> but they're also using this to design vaccines. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, there's been a, a renaissance in vaccine technologies in the last three years. So this is, I guess, the silver lining of a pandemic, which is, was horrible. These technologies will probably help advance uh, vaccine development for other uh, infections, which have been really hard to de deal with. But one wor uh, word of caution, the technologies by themselves are not going to solve all the problems. You still need to do a lot of basic research to understand what is the right confirmation and epitope to make a good vaccine, uh, what is the most appropriate platform and so forth. And then the last, uh, I guess, conclusion for me was the investments in basic research and vaccine platform development now are really essential to support and facilitate 
uh, vaccine development for the next outbreaks. So it's not something you can do at the last minute. You have to really invest early on. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. So, so we do have about five minutes for questions. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Five. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sorry. Okay. So okay. you can call on. People. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sophia. Sophia, United States. When uh, NIH develops a new technology, a new vaccine, how does it choose uh, which company or manufacturer? Yeah. So in the early days of the pandemic, we worked very closely with Barda. We looked at all the developers out there. We sat together, we looked at all the pros and cons, and then we actually, Barda issued these big contract solicitations. We reviewed those and we make, we, we basically tried to diversify the platforms because we, nobody knew what was going to work. So we did two mRNA, two recombinant virus and two proteins. And that's how it was selected. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question on, on these different platforms that we're, we're using. Um, so do you think that certain platforms are better suited to respond to pathogens from certain families so that with the next outbreak, we can also rationally choose our vaccine platform or will yeah. that be more a trial and error? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, in fact, our institute just issued a, a funny opportunity to f exactly figure that out. <laughs> so we identify some viral families that we are concerned about that where the next big outbreak of pandemic may come from. And we asked investigators to figure out what is the best way to develop a vaccine for that viral family. So platform and how do you design the antigen precisely because we don't know. Yeah. Yep. So you described, uh, this is Cristiano from Italy. Uh, you described several uh, vaccine platforms. Can you comment on uh, durability of response, uh, uh, of protection, sorry, uh, for, for them? Do you have any... Uh, comment on that. Yeah, so no, this is a good it. question. And I think many studies are still ongoing. Durability of production has been a little bit complicated by the fact that we have all these new variants now and people keep getting boosted by different variants. It's really hard to figure out someone that goes vaccinated, like how the antibodies wane because there are so many other factors in play. There are studies ongoing. I guess we'll have to wait a few more years to figure out what, what happens. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, you said that for designing the vaccine, uh, you are searching for the epitopes that are associated with neutralizing antibodies, yes? Uh, last day, the, uh, Dr. Uh, Pollard had a presentation and they had a hamster challenge model. And in the alpha version, the lung was full of virus and the neutralizing ad antibody measurement was so high. But in the beta version, uh, the lung was cleared from the virus, but neutralizing antibody was not found. Uh, don't you think that, for example, for designing of the vaccine must be more focused on the other epitopes that maybe are not inducing neutralizing antibody? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to prevent an infection, I think you heard that from yesterday also from Andy and others, you need very high level, usually you need high levels of neutralizing antibodies. If you want to clear an infection that is already ongoing, you need T cells. So ideally, a vaccine would do both. All, all these vaccines I mentioned, especially the mRNA and the recombinant adenovirus induce both T cells and antibodies. The one that is easiest to measure antibodies and that's what has been correlated with protection. But as we move forward to develop a broadly protective vaccines, they're, they're, they're thinking they need to add more antigens beside the spike um, to induce better T cells and a broader immune protection. So you might be able to um, a vaccine that doesn't need to be updated every every few months, like to, just to broaden the production, you're going to offer more antigens to the immune system. So this work is is ongoing. It's, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So just I mean a, a, a question in terms of the use of these newer technologies for I think it's really good to think forward, but also this disease like polio, right? We, we want to eradicate it. So maybe the use of this technology for polio eradication. Uh, I don't know what's, I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations are very invested in the polio. Someone from the Gates Foundation is shaking their heads. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what they're using. It's probably easier to use the current vaccines already licensed because they're tried and true. Um, and it takes a lot of funding to develop a brand new vaccine that you can license. So I don't think they're going to do that for the polio eradication, but it's certainly great to use it for new vaccine that we don't have, like uh, tuberculosis, HIV, and all the other important things that we're still working on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Emmanuel. Um, I'm just wondering, with all these improvements in manufacturing, I, I still wonder why sometimes we have uh, supply challenges. And, uh, and also, like, uh, I mean, like, for example, RTSS vaccine, uh, I mean, the supply is extremely limited for the next five years. For which vaccine? Sorry. The malaria vaccine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you wonder why. Why? I mean, it's like technologies have been improved in terms of manufacturing. And so, so why do we have shortages when? Well, I mean, during the pandemic, there were shortages because a bunch of places were shut down. (laughs) That was an unprecedented challenge that the world faced. Um, For some components of the vaccines, like some of the adjuvants that come from this uh, tree bark that is very so they're trying to make improvements so you don't rely anymore from, let's say, natural sources to make adjuvants and other things. But completely well-taken point, we need to work out a way to stop these shortages because it's not... I mean, even for the yellow fever vaccine, there was a major shortage when there was an outbreak in Africa, and that's just not acceptable. I agree, yeah. So more work needs to be done on that. Good day, Pamela from Cameroon. Uh, my question is on thermostability. During the COVID pandemic, we received a lot of vaccines through the COVAX facility, and many of them did not have vaccine via monitor. So I'm happy to hear that there is a lot of work that's going on on thermostability, and I wanted to know will we be able to have vaccines with the vaccine via monitor delivered to us to ease um, just monitoring and um, how we keep the vaccines? Thank you. Yeah, no. So we, our institute doesn't work on that, but there are many groups, I think like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and SEP and others that really vested in implementation. And I think monitoring of vaccine for their potency is super important. Yeah. Yep. So Dennis from, from Denmark. Um, so, so re- maybe related to the question before. So has there been made any um, larger investigations on on the um, critical path and supply chains in in the field, not only related to the COVID, but but how also COVID affected other supply chains. Um, I'm not aware of that, but I um, I, I don't know this field of supply chain. But I I would bet I bet that some groups are are studying that because that was a really big problem even for for everyone really. So I I I can't answer the question, but that's um, very important. I just ask, you said that nanoparticle vaccines entered the clinic, mm-hmm. right? It, then production was stopped. Yeah. I was just wondering, what was the uh, disease? What was the therapeutic area where they were studied? Oh, no. So that was the vaccine from Korea was on for SARS-CoV-2. Ah, okay. So it was, uh, yeah, a nanoparticle-based vaccine. But uh, once it got into the market, it was licensed. The market was flooded with other vaccines, and there was no market, and they stopped production. But we have proof of concept that could work for the next outbreak. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Esther. Uh, with the recent COVID vaccines and the identified side effects, like the thrombocytopenia and uh, the different side effects of the different vaccines, do the technologies take into, um, into consideration during the next phases how to get rid of those adverse events from the vaccine constitution? Yeah. Um... I think can you, re- can you repeat that? I think it was hard for everyone to hear the question. Uh, okay, sorry. I'm asking about uh, the the recent COVID vaccines. Different vaccines have had different side effects, adverse events, which have been of concern. So, in the in the continuation of the development of the new vaccines using these new technologies, are you looking into changing some of the components of the vaccines that cause the adverse events? So. Um, we're not do- so our institute is doing a lot of these trials, and of course, a big important piece of the trial is to look for adverse events and make sure that it's safe. Uh, I know that some vaccine manufacturers the manufacture the vaccines with adverse events. They're very vested in trying to figure out what happened to tweak their platform to make sure that the, that is. Uh, it, so the studies I think are ongoing from the manufacturer, not um, as far as I know from our institute to understand the mechanism specifically. But it's, yeah, very important. (laughs) Good point. Any other questions?